China Xi Jinping left Moscow today after wrapping up a three-day meeting with his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin. Yesterday, the pair held talks about Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Xi says he wants to help de-escalate the conflict, but his country remains, quote, impartial to the war. CBS News foreign correspondent Remy Innocencio has more. Choreographed pageantry for the world to see. Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin issuing their joint statement on Ukraine. China remains impartial, said she, on the side of peace and right side of history. China's plan could form a basis for a settlement, said Putin, but the West and Kyiv are not ready. That plan from February has been derided by the West. China has not demanded Russia's military to withdraw. In Moscow, Xi and Putin agreed an end to the war should be settled through dialogue, yet gave neither a framework nor detail. After their state dinner, Xi told Putin they are driving changes not seen for 100 years. But with no known decisive deals on trade, energy or Chinese weapons, China's leader was off. Washington says Putin has already blown through resources in the past year ammunition and missiles, the tanks and aircraft he's lost, uh, and absolutely the soldiers, that, that he is literally uh, thrown into a meat grinder. As the world powers talked around Ukraine, within the war-torn country, President Volodymyr Zelensky paid his respects to fallen soldiers, while Ukrainians bear the brunt of daily Russian shelling. We ask God to save the city for fewer deaths, says Lilia. It's very scary because people die every day just going about their business. Or after going to sleep. Overnight, three more people lost their lives around the capital of Kyiv. That's because of fresh Russian strikes. Vlad and Marie. Remy, thank you very much. Let's bring in Robert Daly now. He's the director of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. Uh, Robert, thanks for joining us. Good to be here. So what message did, what do you believe the message from President Xi to the rest of the world was by making this trip to Moscow to visit with Putin, the photo ops, the two of them sitting there, two of them toasting each other. Yeah. What, 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 what is he trying to say there? A lot, a lot of visuals, a lot but of not visuals. a lot of concrete, I don't know, decisions. Yeah, but if a picture isn't worth a thousand words, you say we're impartial, but then uh, we're kicking back some drinks. Right. <laughs> Right. Uh, well, he's sending different messages to different parts of the world. First, mm. to China itself, he's saying, I, Xi Jinping, your leader, am respected around the world. I shape global events. I am worthy of your support, and I'm pushing for peace. Those are the messages for China. Uh, to the United States, NATO, Japan, South Korea, he is saying that China and Russia are powerful partners uh, that you cannot dismiss and that you cannot take lightly. China is standing with Russia, with Iran, and then with other smaller countries, North Korea, Cuba, to offer a world order that it sees an alter as an alternative to an order that is you know, sort of defined by and manipulated by the United States. And this message, while it's antagonistic in the West, may have adherence in less developed countries, poorer countries in, in Africa, in South America. So different messages for different audiences. Yeah, and this is sort of a, a pathway that China has been building for a while now. Yes. And, you know, you point out other countries. We've seen, particularly in Africa, there have been countries that have been hesitant to overtly criticize Russia mm -hmm. for its invasion of Ukraine, not wanting to sort of destabilize um, these relationships. Um, and so here we have a study in uh, from the Lowry Institute in 2021 that shows that China has more embassies and commissions than any other country in the world. How is China's efforts to expand its influence impacting the way the U.S. conducts itself globally? Well, it, it's the right question. There's a story here not just of Chinese activity, but of American inactivity and American negligence. Mm. We have under-neglected uh, we have neglected and underinvested in American diplomacy. We put an awful lot of money into deterrence and to our military budgets, but not into the State Department. And particularly in poorer countries, in what's called the Global South, China has long since stolen a march on us. China is the primary trading partner of most of these countries. It is uh, the primary lender for infrastructure development. It provides a lot of other kinds of investment, and it is putting 
bodies on the ground, uh, which the United States uh, simply hasn't done. So there's a tendency in Washington to see all of this as a story about you know, a nefarious China and a nefarious Russia. And they are indeed malign actors in many cases. But the real issue is the United States negligence of you know not only Latin America and Africa, but Southeast Asia, Central Asia, Oceania, we're simply not present. Yeah, and it's such an excellent point, Robert, because even in the media, you hear uh, reports of Chinese expansion, the Chinese, uh, uh, um, their goals in the South Pacific, specifically as it relates uh, in, in East Asia to Taiwan. But you rarely hear any reports uh, talking about what China is doing in Africa or in Latin America or in other countries um, that perhaps don't had the same geopolitical uh, risks for the United States as perhaps Taiwan or Japan. But what, I mean, as a former foreign correspondent in Africa, I could see firsthand on the ground what uh, they were doing um, in some African countries, and it's not all bad. Right. Uh, they are building airports and highways and naval ports, many of which they also run. We're concerned about that, but they provide real goods for people on the ground who have better transportation in some cases uh, and who have better services. Now, China's not doing this out of the kindness of its heart. A lot of this is tied to extractive industries. China has locked up a lot of Africa's graphite, cobalt, bauxite, uh, the critical minerals that go into a lot of consumer goods and computers. China's highly self-interested in this way, but it does help local economies as well. Africa is the fastest growing continent in the world. It's, as you know, it's, it's a very young continent with tremendous potential, uh, but we have a hard time getting American corporations to take an interest in it. China can order its corporations to take an interest in it. But you know, it's it's an it, that's an, also an excellent point. But let's also remember that uh, the West, for years, hundreds of years, did exactly the same thing. I mean, right? Uh, the United States, Britain, France, Spain—they uh, all went into Africa. They built schools, they built roads, they colonized these nations. The point was also to extract their diamonds, their natural resources, uh, whatever it is they could get their hands on before those countries gained their independence. Right. But when, when China does this, it goes in as a fellow historical victim of mm. colonialism. And this is you, you get back to the Xi Putin meeting and why that works. They have a victim narrative. They talk about their strength, but they also present themselves as victims mm. of the collective global West to tie into that anti-colonialist narrative. Now, this doesn't always work. Many in Africa have said that China th is engaged in neocolonialism yeah. because it's extracting raw materials and then selling back in finished products. So uh, we don't know where China's story in, in Africa goes, uh, but we do know that we need to step up our own game. That's really fascinating. It is. And, and Robert, one, there's one country you didn't mention uh, who those optics were for. I'm curious what you think. Russia, because in my mind, and again, you're the expert, but I, I sort of see if you go back to the the, the Chinese Revolution in the 1940s, um, China was seen as the little brother right. to the Soviet Union. Does it? Is, are we yeah. to believe that the relationship has flipped, where China is ascendant and Russia, it's no longer a, a big Soviet Union of multiple countries? But when you say Russia as an audience, you mean Russia or Russians in Russia? Are you talking Ooh. about the because we I, know I, that yeah. what they're seeing is not what we're yeah, seeing. Yeah, I guess right? Russians, right? right? What they're hearing, because if they listen to Putin, they believe that they're winning the war in Ukraine. What is the message that Xi Jinping, what is Vladimir Putin showing his people by this meeting? Well, he, he's showing them that, that Russia is not alone, that Ooh. it has the world's second biggest economy, most populous nation uh, on its side. And to what degree China is on its side, that is an open question. But it is also clear, I think, to most Russians that China is, as you say, the younger brother, the lesser country uh, in this relationship. You know, Putin started this war in part uh, because he thought that Russia or Slavs uh, and Russians outside of Russia were becoming in some ways subservient to or dependent on the West. And now he's giving them dependence on China instead. Uh, it's very far from clear how that plays out. While China and Russia have a common interest in standing against the U.S., they have a lot of historical distrust of each other. And the Chinese and Russian people 
really don't know each other. They're not involved with each other uh, in the way that they've been involved with Europe and with the United States. So the, the coming together of these two leaders is consequential. America needs to pay very close attention. But they don't necessarily stand toe-to-toe -to -toe all of the time in every single area. Mm. Mm. Robert, thank you very much.